Welcome everyone to the bootstrapping session with co-founder and CEO of Silo AI, Peter Sarlin. I'm Henry Mäkivirta, CPO at SLAS. Uh, I'm res responsible for all the digital products that we have at SLAS. So, for example, all the issues in the matchmaking tool, I'm the one you should blame. Silo AI. A few months ago in July, Silo AI was acquired by Silicon Valley Semiconductor company AMD with a $665 million cash acquisition. The, deal was, the cash deal was the largest in Europe uh, in AI. The company was founded in 2017 to help businesses by building AI solutions for them through strategic partnerships. Since then, uh, Zillow AI has launched uh, LLM focused on European language, languages, uh, an end-to-end -end platform for AI tools and infrastructure. During the acquisition, uh, the company had 300 employees. Uh, half of them had PhDs, so a company with big brains. Peter, uh, what gap in the European AI and tech landscape did you see when founding Silo AI in 2017? Yeah, and, and thanks for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, uh, and, and thanks for the great introduction. Uh, it does take a team, right? Uh, so obviously I've to some extent contributed, but so have many others, uh, a bunch of co-founders and, and many brilliant colleague, colleagues along, along the way. Um, and uh, uh, t together with the, with the co-founding team in, in 2017, when we, we founded the company, um, we actually got together one of our, our co-founders, Juha Hulko, who is a, a, a sort of a well-known entrepreneur since the many past decades in Finland. Um, we, we shared the same concern. Um, how do we ensure Europe's competitiveness? How do we ensure Finland's competitiveness? Um, and that was the previous AI wave. So not this one, uh, but, but the one that happened in 2016, 17, 18. And, um, you know, that, I think the, the, the reality then, which is actually fairly similar to the reality today, is that some, we need to do something to ensure our competitiveness. And we have uh, uh, talent to, to some extent, but we need to ensure that we retain that talent and ensure that sort of companies in the region um, stay competitive. Uh, and, and that was the intent with which we set up Silo. Um, and we did set up Silo as a private AI lab. So I left a professorship with my research group and yeah. uh, um, then eventually we started to grow the team around that. Why did you decide to go with the lab instead of, let's say, building a product company? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think again, the market is now in a bit of a similar state uh, compared to 2017. Uh, many were interested in AI, many were doing something in AI. But it wasn't entirely clear sort of where, where value will accrue and, and, uh, and how the market will evolve. Well, we've, we've come far uh, in terms of technology. We've come far in terms of adoption. But I would say especially then, um, it, it wasn't entirely clear what sort of uh, um, what the role AI would play um, uh, in, in given the state of not only AI, but also technology overall. Um, I think we were pulled into every direction um, in the very early days. If we would have sort of initiated building silo with a very specific narrow goal uh, or product in, in, in mind, then you know, I think we certainly would not have hit the nail. Um, and, and then, of course, I mean, we, we already had the sort of senior academic pedigree. Um, and uh, we had been working, I mean, I uh, also in academia had been working at the intersection of academia and industry. So sort of building these strategic partnerships was a very natural sort of continuation to that, but then doing that as a commercial activity was obviously the jump ship when we moved to Silo. Yeah, what were the first partnerships like? Like who did you partner up with? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, I think they would be, uh, um, they would be embarrassing to the extent that I'm not going to share all of this sort of, but, but the reality was that the market was in a proof of concept experiment type of a setting where everyone was trying to do something, everyone was innovating, and we didn't sort of really even understand how to address that market. So to us, 2017, we founded the company end of the year, then 2018, 
we were still sort of looking for direction. Um, we, we, were, we were sort of struggling with profitability. We did not have external capital. Uh, we we uh, eventually were trying to understand, you know, what creates value in, in, in the AI space and how do you actually sort of operate in a way so that you eventually can run a business. Um, and majority of the initial uh, sort of work we did was, uh, you know, basically sprinkling AI across the enterprise. Um, and I think a key driver to eventually then, you know, pivoting towards the direction that then took us uh, through sort of fairly rapid growth during the, the upcoming years. Yeah. How has your view towards value creation in AI or with AI evolved since the founding of Siloia? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and that, you know, uh, that, that, that's, that, that makes it more concrete. So, I mean, what I've said so far is that um, I think the market didn't really get it, um, and we were listening to the market, um, and hence we didn't really get it. Um, and then, and then uh, you know, in 2019, we, we eventually sort of, we, we, we de derived out of all of the learnings, um, we derived a, a very sort of explicit strategy to focus on uh, uh, positioning Silo as an R&D partner um, to work with, uh, say, industry-leading companies across the world, various industries, um, and to help them build AI at the core of their products, their scalable digital services, products, platforms, uh, and 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 that that sort of you know that that. That changed the way we create value and the way we could then eventually scale. And you referred to strategic partnerships. Yeah. Only at that stage, uh, you know, I would call it strategic partnerships. And yeah. that took us from everything to, you know, ranging from autonomous vehicles to optimizing image quality on your mobile phone to web scale search engines, medical devices and cancer diagnostics and a wide range of different software products out there. Was that also the kind of key infliction point of your growth or like when did that happen and why? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's a combination of eventually building sort of an understanding of the market, then building our capabilities. So we were a group of researchers uh, when we kicked off. Uh, then we, it took a year or two to, to grow to say 30 people. Uh, and then after that, we, we, we basically scaled to 200 fairly quickly. Um, and, and that, of course, increased our credibility in the, in the market. Uh, but we were still doing, I mean, as, as this sort of session states, we were doing it together with customers as we were bootstrapping. And then building all the, the sort of infrastructure and tooling our platform uh, and the accelerators that allowed us to sort of be the best partner when, when you're building AI uh, at the core of your product and AI that you own and control and that eventually goes into vehicles or smart devices. Yeah. All right, uh, let's go into bootstrapping. AI company, bootstrapping, like what, what motivated you to choose bootstrapping over like chasing external funding for Silo? Yeah, I, mean, I, I guess every, every say story and company is different, uh, but, but I mean, I do think I mean, for us, it, it really it's, an, it's sort of an ownership strategy question. Um, and, and I guess that that's sort of how everyone should, that's how I think everyone should think about it. And, and it doesn't happen sort of by mistake, right? Uh, um, and bootstrapping, I mean, now we're kind of in a session about bootstrapping, but bootstrapping in itself isn't to me really, it's more of a philosophy rather than a, a set of actions or, you know, uh, w what should I do? Um, you know, it really depends, uh, but, it, but it, is, it is sort of a mindset. And, and, and the way we looked at, uh, you know, building a, a sustainable business for the long term, um, having a very long term perspective in, in how we build, um, and, and then eventually sort of accepting and understanding that the market is very immature. Um, and if we would have approached the market with, uh, with a specific product, AI product or model, um, I don't think we would have made it. Um, and, and I'm I'm not saying that just because sort of you know eventually we're in a pretty good position now. I'm saying it because I mean if you look at the market, how many how many AI companies do we have today 
that were founded before 2016, 2017? No, not, not many, many. Yeah. not many. So, you know, we did an explicit decision uh, among the founders and the owners in the beginning that, uh, that we, we want to build a, um, a, a company on a sustainable basis. We are not sort of getting external capital as our, you know, the first step. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't raise capital later. We were always yeah. open to do that and we actually did that. Yeah. Um, but, but it was the sort of philosophy and eventually ownership strategy that we signed off yeah. uh, when we founded the company. Yeah. Let's go to the external funding, funding later. Uh, you mentioned that the bootstrapping is almost a, like a philosophy for you. Uh, so having to create the revenue from the start, how did that affect your idea of like value creation? Well, I mean, I guess, you know, we, we have ideas and, and the more you think, the more ideas you have. But um, if, if you're cash constrained, you know, it, it, it implies that you need to act. I mean, you eventually, you know, it pushes you uh, to en eventually ensure that you find a pocket in the market where you're creating enough value um, to, to be able to sustainably grow. Um, and, and, you know, who knows um, if for us or, or, you know, probably for many, um, it's easy to raise capital in the AI space. Um, it's much more difficult to actually find a sort of pocket in the market and create sustainable value going forward and, and build a long-term sustainable business. Uh, and it's not only AI, it's, you know, everywhere. Um, so I think it really pushed us um, to find that position in the market. And, and for, you know, it might sound obvious um, and the things we've done might, you know, to a certain extent they were even sort of very simple things. Anyone could do that. But it takes focus and it pushes you to, to sort of steer everything you do towards that same direction um, rather than go after all of the opportunities in the AI space that certainly have, they are now vast, but they have been vast throughout the past many years. Yeah. How about growth? Like uh, retaining your first customers or in your case, your first partners uh, without significant marketing? Like, how did you approach retaining the partners, or did you retain them? Like, how how were you able to grow? I I wonder whether there's sort of one answer to that. To that, I mean, it's it's again, it's a set of many things. Um, we've we've always been ambitious in uh, you know um, on every level in in the way we built the the first you know the team. Uh, and, and that has allowed us to grow. Talented people want to work with other talented people. Um, we had top-notch researchers uh, in the you know, founding team and, and in, in, uh, in the, the first sort of members of our technical team. Uh, and I think that allowed us to sort of grow into a fairly, even being at say 30 person uh, AI company, pure play AI company in Europe and, and in 2017 sort of put us in a, somewhat significant position uh, in, in the market then. Um, and then sort of being ambitious enough to, to go after uh, the, the largest accounts in the space. And I think that really uh, has been a decisive factor throughout. I mean, we've basically, we've had, uh, you know, a very dedicated sales effort throughout. Account-based sales uh, targeted a very short list of the top companies that are investing most in R&D, where we believe we can create most value, uh, say in autonomous vehicles, say in smart devices. And then sort of, you know, uh, it, it's, I don't think it's a, in, in that sort of kind of strategic partnership building, you know, the founder is the salesperson. Yeah. And it's not only me, it's the founding team. Um, and, uh, you know, it just basically takes uh, um, a lot of effort in opening up, deliberately opening up the strategic accounts that you want to work with. Yeah. What were the hardest challenges uh, you faced while bootstrapping and how did you overcome them? Yeah, I guess, I guess, you know, we've, I, I mean, I think, what is a challenge, right? Uh, we have challenges every year, every month, every week, every day. Um, and uh, I, I guess that's, that's what, if, 
you know, for most entrepreneurs, uh, successful entrepreneurs, I think you you get energy from challenges, from solving challenges, and I don't think we've like bootstrapping is in any way sort of different. Um, you know, you just uh, have to go at it, and uh, uh, we've of course had a number of challenges along the way. We were very resource and capital constrained in the beginning. Yeah. Um, and uh, we, there was a lot of uncertainty. We, I think, we we got our first salary uh, after a, you know a few years of efforts. Uh, we uh, um, we were extremely capital constrained after one uh, one and a half years. Uh, we were not making a profit. Uh, we did not have any external funding. Um, and uh, you know it, it took tough decisions and you know where do we focus what do we do and uh, and and sort of redirecting di di our direction towards that and and then of course also i mean you know all the strategic changes along the way i, I but i i see the challenge is more as opportunities that's what allowed us to grow we we took in a bit of external capital in 2022 yeah. um and I think that was an opportunity. We, we, we basically changed our strategy to go in to basically be a model builder uh, and build out a SaaS platform uh, and take that out to market. We had to basically go at sort of this market and uh, it didn't come without sort of problems. Um, yeah. But I think that's been the opportunities uh, for us. What about like recruiting? Uh, acquiring talent uh, or customers. You said that like you were able to find customers like these top top partnerships. You were able to chase them. But how about like acquiring talent? Uh, I would imagine that like external funding, uh, some flashy VC names can help you win over some talent. But like, was that a challenge for you, or was that something that uh, you were able to able to sell easily? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a very good question because that's been obviously at the core of you know what we do, who we are, how we operate, uh, to build the best AI team uh, in the world, and 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 especially build an environment that attracts the best people, the most talented uh, AI scientists and engineers. Um, it doesn't actually take money, right, to to build sort of a, a value base and then a strong culture. Uh, on top of that value base um, that provides a good environment for the most talented people. I mean, if you look at uh, AI scientists that come with a PhD with a, from a postdoc, from a professorship, um, they want to work on the most challenging problems with the most talented people. Um, and we've tried to sort of uh, basically offer that environment. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it takes dedicated effort. I mean, it's just work, you know. you. You, you need to, I mean, the labor market today doesn't work in a way where you just open a few job positions and, and then the best scientists out there will apply. Yeah. So we've done a bit of dedicated effort in recruiting the best and yeah. attracting the best to, to Finland. Many have moved from abroad. Majority of our employees have a, a foreign background. Um, we have sizable offices across Europe. We have an office in, our, in, in Vancouver. So, you know, we've put dedicated effort in building out the, the talent base, yeah. yeah. Did you keep that in mind also when selecting the partnerships that you want to do? Like, this is going to be cool for the scientists. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's, let's do it. Uh, or like, was that yeah. also uh, a long... Yeah, yeah, yeah. O of course. Uh, I, I mean, the, but it, it, it correlates, right? Um, when you get to work with, uh, you know, uh, some of the leading initiatives in the world on autonomous vehicles, uh, or s on say, uh, say search engines, or uh, say optimizing image quality on your mobile phone, uh, or such, uh, you know, th that those are some of the most difficult problems in the world. Um, they create significant value uh, in the world and yeah. to end customers. Um, but of course, eventually, as as a if you are, even though you're technically oriented, uh, the people that have joined us, they have decided explicitly that they're not anymore on a pure academic track, but they want to create value in the real world. Um, and then we need to deliver such uh, initiatives and such work, right? Yeah. Are there any misconceptions about bootstrapping that you'd like to maybe address? 
Yeah, I, again, I'm, it's, it's difficult to sort of talk about it from the perspective of bootstrap, bootstrapping being sort of an explicit activity. Um, you know, I think it's, I actually would say that it's, it's not, you know, there's no reason why you should. For, for, for some companies, it's a good path. For others, uh, it's impossible. It's, you know, you need to do significant upfront investments in, uh, in infrastructure or, or otherwise. Um, but, but I mean, I think uh, it does sort of require re relentless effort. Uh, it's, it, it requires a lot of work, uh, uh, both on, on, say, building the team recruitment, as you highlighted earlier, but also and especially in building sort of sales, in, in building customer relationships and, yeah. and larger partnerships. Um, if you would have to like choose again in hindsight, would you chose this bootstrapping road again now that you've, uh, for example, uh, raised external funding uh, as well? Uh, like, would you still do the same? Or would you raise funding earlier? Was this the right point uh, when you raised the private equity round in 2022? I, I, I'd be very hesitant in giving sort of uh, one advice on, on this. I mean, I, I you know, I truly think that uh, a large number of the companies and founders that are here that are thinking about, you know, should I raise capital or not, many of them probably should raise capital and many of them should raise early. Some of them, maybe they should raise a little bit later, maybe they should raise more, maybe they should la raise less. I, it really depends. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I, I do think that uh, everyone benefits from being resource constrained. Uh, and I think from time to time you might have access to too much capital. Yeah. Um, and being resource constrained, even though you have uh, access to capital, having a mindset where you are resource constrained and, and ensure, relentlessly ensure that you're sort of continuously creating more value and on the path to basically, you know, a, a sustainable business um, could, could be valuable. Yeah. You now have uh, your own LLM model and uh, platform. So you have products now. How did you know that it was right time to uh, do those things? Hmm. So yeah, we took in a bit of capital in 2022. And uh, that was, we, we had more than doubled in size for four years, four and a half years in a row. Uh, uh, profitably, uh, both in size in terms of headcount and uh, but also revenue, um, and and we we were on a path to grow, but at the same time uh, we we knew that if we want to take the company uh, sort of to to the next level, um, we need to find a good partner, uh, or we believed that we need to find a good partner that allows us to do a few strategic investments. Um, so we partnered up with Altor, uh, a private equity fund uh, that, you know, were that good partner, um, which gave a little bit of capital uh, to, to basically, first of all, invest in, in internationalization. We basically set up uh, a number of uh, offices like our Vancouver office uh, to serve especially the West Coast uh, in the US West Coast, uh, which we were already operating in. Um, and uh, then we acquired uh, two companies that also sort of expanded our, say, footprint in Europe, uh, both in, in uh, the Wallenberg-led the Wallenberg -led, uh, AI company, Combient Mix in Sweden, and then also uh, an AI company in the Netherlands. Uh, but then it allowed us to basically double down on, on some of our infrastructure and tooling investments that we had been already doing. Yeah. Uh, and, and all of that was sort of customer led. So our product development was happening together with customers and uh, solving customer needs, uh, but not with, with a pressure to basically deliver revenue. Yeah. Uh, and that allowed us to basically then uh, build out a totally separate entity um, uh, with a model as a service platform and then own large language models as you highlighted. Yeah. Um, that were fully aligned with the strategy that we had in, in place. What are your scientists uh, and your employees most excited about right now? Right now, um, 
Well, we've, we've joined, as you highlighted in the very beginning, uh, we are uh, very excited about the, the opportunity going forward with, within and with AMD. Um, we uh, uh, obviously have, you know, have been working with customers and, and, and engaging AI initiatives for the past many years, um, but I think everyone, um, you know, sees that there's a tremendous opportunity uh, to work on even larger, more exciting uh, um, AI at, at AMD. Um, and that's what, where we were already sort of deployed. So now uh, turn focus to uh, ob obviously serving many of our uh, customers still, but turn focus to uh, create value on top of AMD compute platforms. Uh, we've basically tuned our uh, model as a service platform to be optim optimized for uh, AMD compute and AMD GPUs. Um, we're, we're basically optimizing our models, open source models, and expanding our open source model roadmap, including European languages, but also adding further languages, and optimizing again for AMD compute. Um, and then deploying the entire team with some of the most exciting AI initiatives across the world. That's super cool. All right, final question. What are the key takeaways aspiring bootstrap founder should take? Yeah, I mean, I'll, uh, that's the, I'll, I'll end with, with some of the remarks that I've already, I guess, said. I mean, I, I, I do still see it as a little bit of, a, I mean, bootstrapping in itself isn't really any, any specific action. It's a very, you know, it's a way of looking at the world in, in a specific context, and for some it makes sense, for others not. I, I, I think, you know, maybe probably what describes our culture and, and you know, maybe one could say what describes me as a founder as well. Um, what, what we've said is, is ambitious yet humble. We've always had or tried to at least have the humility uh, to basically put in the work that is needed. Uh, and then also the sort of, uh, you know, am, am, ambitious targets that you need to have in place in order to eventually, you know, build something big. Ambitious but humble, put in the work. Thank you, Peter Sarlin. Uh, after this session, there's going to be a Q&A uh, right over there. You can enter through the uh, mentoring area, and there you can ask Peter questions directly yourself. But thank you so much uh, for the session. Thank you. Thank you.